yesterday we had a a record breaking um a record breaking uh uh number of deaths yesterday yesterday we had a record uh, number of deaths and it was it was quite interesting to watch it was a um a day where China had only about a hundred and uh, what was it, one hundred and fifty Stu that had died. The, the worst day for China, any individual day, was one hundred and fifty deaths. Yes. Now tell me, tell me what happened uh, yesterday in Italy. In on Sunday, yep, last two days in Italy, have? 368 died in Italy. Obviously a much smaller mm-hmm. country. We don't need to note that, but uh, that's a pretty significant number. And then yesterday was 349. So the two highest days of any country were Italy the last two days. That makes the death toll in Italy 2,138 since February 20th, when a 38-year-old man just checked himself into the hospital and tested positive for the virus. Now, I want to talk to you here about the northern Lombardy region of Italy. It's taken the brunt of the damage, and it's starting really to show. Makeshift triage units have popped up, tents full of tired doctors clad in full-body hazmat suits, including the bright green sacks that cover their shoes and the hoods and the eye gear. Hospitals are overrun. Things are being rationed now. They have to choose. Who gets this? A 45-year-old man? Or an 80-year-old man. It's the worst. One Italian doctor said, the outbreak has put hospitals under a stress that we have not seen since the Second World War. 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 It's a word that we're hearing now when we're seeing the spread of COVID-19 through Italy. War. And for a good reason. On Thursday, a group of healthcare specialists released guidelines for dealing with COVID-19 with what they called... Catastrophe medicine. Catastrophe medicine. I want to give you a quote. In context of grave shortage of health resources, the guidelines say intensive care should be given to patients with the best chances of success and the best hope for life should be prioritized. And that, quote, in the interest of maximizing benefits for the largest number, limits could be put on intensive care units to reserve scarce resources for those who have first a greater likelihood of survival, and secondly, who have more potential years of life. We are in the death panel, except there's no panel. It's just the person at triage. Yesterday, in a hospital, a city in northern Italy, about 200,000 people, they ran out of ICU valves. Now, this is the closed system, the stopcock-like lever that allows nurses to control the flow of blood or medicine or in some cases, the contents of feeding tubes. If you don't have those ICU valves, hospitals are far more dangerous for everybody. They're part of the sterilization uh, sterilization process, and attempting to run a medical facility without these is kind of like driving a car without any kind of springs or shocks. Yeah, mm, it'll last, but not for very long. Technology is going to save us. Stephen Hawking said once, science can lift people out of poverty and cure disease. That, in turn, will reduce civil unrest. Stephen Hawking. But the technologies that arise are going to be unexpected, as they always have been the case, if we keep our wits about us and we care to to look. Right now, everybody's pointing fingers. Everybody is yelling at each other. Why didn't you do this? We weren't prepared for that. Can we just spend a minute and look at what Miracles are happening because that's what I want to do for the next few minutes. Elon Musk said, if anyone thinks they'd rather be in a different part of history, they're probably not a very good student of history because life sucked in the old days. People knew very little and you were likely to die at a very young age of some horrible disease. Let me go back to that hospital I was telling you about in Northern Italy. The one that ran out of ICU valves. Somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody had a local business. Yes, a local business. It wasn't a socialist 
that had the idea. It was a capitalist, a local business. They rushed to the hospital with a 3D printer. And within hours, they had designed and produced new valves. So far, last we checked, 10 patients are accompanied in breathing by a machine that now uses one of these 3D printed valves. Technology, an entrepreneur, somebody who just doesn't wait for somebody else. They're not waiting for the government or bitching about the government. We don't have enough ICU valves. They went out and made them. Now, we're still fact-checking and investigating this story. We received the tip through Twitter, and we'll update you as more details emerge. But since, since we discovered the story, it's been confirmed by a reputable Italian newspaper, La Stampa, who just gave us an update on the story. The supplier of the ICU valves was upset with the hospital's decision to accept a 3D printed valve and refused to provide any sort of blueprints or files. The point I want to make here is, is about the power of technology. This is, not, this is also not just a rebuke of um, any sort of healthcare apparatus. I'm, I'm not railing against the medical device industry. Even the supplier of the valves, it's not their fault. What I want to talk to you about is a dis- an article we discovered from an academic journal out of Johns Hopkins. The, the article was titled, Impact of Technology on the Emergence of Infectious Diseases. And it begins like this. Uh, technological advances during this century have led to unparalleled improvements in comfort, productivity, and lifespan. The impact of technology on the practice of medicine is among the most salutary changes that has occurred during the 20th century. You know, one thing we didn't see coming, we didn't see ICU valves being needed because of COVID-19 and a pandemic, and it would be saved through a 3D printer. We never saw that coming. In fact, an entire movement now we didn't see coming. It's now, it's called Project Open Air. As I mentioned, we're still vetting this ongoing story, but Project Open Air, by all accounts, is a legitimate organization now that has been heralded by scientists and engineers and academics, including Scott Horton. He's the director of the Libertarian Institute. Five days ago, a 40-year-old Portuguese scientist studying neuroscience at Harvard took to Twitter and spread the word about Project Open Air. It was just then comprised of a small group of Harvard scientists, and here's what he said. We're working on medical devices such as open-source ventilators to have fast and easy solutions that can be reproduced and assembled locally worldwide. If you have any skills, consider helping us. Join us at projectopenair.org. In 24 hours, the group had assembled already 500 of the greatest specialists in the fields of engineering, medicine, institutions like MIT, Caltech, Stanford. It's a week later now, and they have 2,500 people. Their medium, Slack. The application of the business world, a kind of mega-sized chat room for entire companies or groups. We use it at Blaze Media and Mercury Radio Arts. Another technical innovation that has unexpectedly advanced medicine. Put this program on the air today. Here's the thing. Can we stop complaining about what we don't know? Let's just start doing what we do know. Do what we are supposed to do. Be the people we were born to be. You know, we were born at this time because, quite honestly, we're special souls. We were born here with everything that we need and all the equipment we need to be able to take mankind into a more free state, into a better place. And at the end of this chaos, after we have buried, hopefully not too many of our friends or loved ones, the coronavirus will have advanced technology by five years. That's an awe-inspiring achievement in 2020. If I may quote John F. Kennedy, Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depths, and encourage the arts and commerce. Remember, as we trudge forward, as we spend the next few days and weeks confined in our homes, 
staring out at an increasingly motionless world, remember that everything we do nonetheless is advancing man. Man is either retreating or advancing. And Americans have always chosen to advance.